Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. When you approach Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, one of the first things you see is a large labyrinth that's laid out in front of the entrance, this imposing place of worship. It's a lovely design of stone and marble that invites you to wander with its turning and winding pathways, much like the labyrinth we have here in the north side of the building. When you enter the cathedral, you are greeted by a second labyrinth of the same design as the one outside. So whether you are simply wandering around the grounds of the cathedral or you cross into the threshold of this magnificent sacred space, you cannot help avoid walking on these ancient symbols of a circle and a swirling spire. Maybe this was the reason of placing one labyrinth outside the walls as well as one within the walls of the cathedral. They are powerful reminders that wherever we are, we are on a spiritual journey, a journey toward wholeness, the pathway into our interior lives where we encounter the mystery of God, ever present in our lives, wherever we may be. Erasmus, the Renaissance theologian, reminds us that, bidden or unbidden, God is present. No matter where we are in our spiritual journey, God calls us to be in the world, to be with one another, to love one another as God loves us. In today's Gospel reading, we witness Jesus' final prayer to him for his disciples, his closest friends that he will soon leave behind. This is known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. We're going back to Monday Thursday. Jesus and his inner circle are gathered together in the upper room where they have just shared their last meal together. Jesus has gotten on his knees to wash the disciples' feet. Judas has quietly departed to betray the one he loves, while Jesus foretells Peter that he will deny him three times. Now, with only a few hours left on this earth, Jesus turns to God to pray for his disciples' protection and well-being knowing that they soon will be going out into the world to spread the message of God's love as he has shown them and trained them. This is a dangerous business in a dangerous world, a brutal world that has fallen far from God's grace. Not so different from our world today. Jesus is clear that neither he nor his disciples are of this world. In other words, Jesus is teaching us what it means to be people of God. They do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world, Jesus says. He goes further and prays that his disciples are sanctified in the truth of God's word. Now, Jesus is not talking about some type of holier-than-thou piety. To sanctify means literally to set apart for God's purposes. And this setting apart, being sanctified, is a necessity because it enables them to be in the world but not corrupted by it. Only then can the disciples go out into the world to spread the news of God's love, sustained and protected by God. But Jesus does not stop there. When you read the next few verses beyond today's reading, which I encourage you to do, you will see that Jesus expands his prayer to include all future generations. He says, I ask not only on behalf of these, but also on the behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that all may be one. Jesus is praying for you and for me. He is praying that we will be sanctified for the truth of God's word. That like his disciples, we will be set apart from the brokenness of this world 
and claim our identity as God's beloved. Because as people of God, we are in the world, but not of this world. Our baptism is a public affirmation and assurance of our sanctification, that we are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. Nothing, nothing can undo that. Jesus prays that we all may be one, unified as a church here on earth. In short, we are the church. You and I have been ordained by virtue of our baptism to go out and proclaim this good news to the world through our actions. As St. Francis teaches us, spread the gospel, but use words only if you must. The labyrinths of Grace Cathedral, both inside and outside the walls, echo the reality of our spiritual journey, a journey where God calls us to live vitally and faithfully in the world, not owned by it, but fully engaged with its needs and its wounds. It begins with each one of us showing up and walking the winding pathways of our lives God has set before us. We see this from our reading from Acts. Peter assumes the role of leader now that Jesus is gone as the disciples transition into their mission to go out into the world sharing the good news just as Jesus taught them. However, sometimes we reach a dead end and we must choose another pathway. Other times the path we have chosen takes us to places and experiences we never could have imagined. But no matter where our path leads us, we are called to reach out to each other in love and compassion along the way. I'm not sure who, but someone wisely said that 90% of life is showing up. But it is so true. Every Sunday morning, churches all over the world, people show up in person. Here in St. Michael's, we show up in person, we show up on Zoom. And this is important because this is the one day of the week when our entire community comes together as one, as the living body of Christ. Together we give thanks and we praise to God for the life we have been given. Participating in the Holy Eucharist, which is Greek for Thanksgiving, we take the host, the body of Christ, as an acknowledgement that God has a claim on our lives. And in response, we are called to reach out and share God's abundant love with those the world has forgotten or discarded, because they also belong to God. This is what it means to be church. A few years ago, a colleague of mine shared a poem which captures the power of reaching out to love our neighbor, just as Jesus taught us. When we do, lives are transformed, both for the giver and the receiver. So I invite you to close your eyes, if you'd like, and just listen to these words and let them float over you and imagine you being present in this room. It's called the communion. Blind and alone, she sat on her bed and sang an old hymn from an old church. She sang for herself. Her sound came from somewhere deep in her being. To sing was her need. Her needing made me stop. And somewhere between her singing and my stopping, something happened that had never happened before. I entered her room. I said in faulted Spanish, I come with God, with Jesus Cristo, for you. She shook into tears. I come with a holy communion, el cuerpo, De Jesu Cristo for two. She began to nod, and her blind, closed eyes wept. 
Somehow her desire had reached me, and the surprise and joy could not be count contained in words or smiles. And she said, I was so alone. And I said, Jesu Christo has come. I have come. And I held her and tried to talk, but we were both beyond words. Amen. Amen.